Hey again, friends. This time we're going to be reading chapter 6 through 8 of The Secret of the Indian. Remember what happened in the last chapter. Emma, the little girl, had actually seen the little people. Remember Patrick's cousin, Emma? She had actually seen the little people in Omri's room, and Omri is panicking. So let's start with chapter 6, A New Insider. Emma, what, what, what are you doing here? But it was only too obvious what she was doing. She was looking and listening. The only question left was how much had she seen and heard? In a forlorn and desperate hope, Omri swiveled his eyes sideways, trying to see what was visible from her angle. Before, when he'd been crouching in front of that desk, he had blocked her view of the seed tray. Now that he was on the floor, everything was in plain sight. Matron's little figure, standing arms akimbo on the edge of the seed tray. Little Bear's pony grazing in the miniature paddock Patrick had made. Several tiny Indians busy about the area, rebuilding last night's fire from uh, the unburned ends of matchsticks and twigs. And the longhouse rising from the ground in all of its minute handmade magnificence. But Emma was not looking as far as that. On the low table that stood between her and Omri was the cupboard and the five Indians. They were chanting and doing a slow dance around the white paper packet. It was upon them, Omri saw, that Emma's eyes were riveted. There was nothing to be done. Not zilch. zippity doo Zero. And when that's the case, thought Omri in a sudden mood of fatalism, you might as well relax. Well, he said, his voice coming out quite steady, what do you think? She stared at them for a long time, her eyes fixed and unblinking, her freckles standing out on a suddenly very pale face. There... They were alive, she said at last, in a doubtful tone, as if he might roar with laughter at her. Well, you don't say, said Omri, scrambling to his feet, and not only on those, and not only those, what about these here? And he indicated the seed tray behind him. Emma moved cautiously forward, as if afraid the very floor might waver and give way beneath her feet. He noticed now that she had a mug of tea in her hand, the one that he'd saved from breakfast. It must have been the excuse that she'd given herself for following him up. It tilted in her nerveless fingers, and he removed it to safety. As he poured a few drops into a toothpaste cap for Matron, Omri reached Emma as she gazed and gazed. He knew that was, his father, that was what his father called a quantum leap that had been taken in the situation, the sort of change that means nothing will ever quite be the same ever again, and that was scary. But there was no denying a sort of enjoyment in watching someone else seeing, trying to realize, coming to grips with it. Emma managed this last beat surprisingly quickly. I have always thought it could happen, she said abruptly. If often nearly has, when I've been playing with my toy animals. Can they talk? Oh, of course they can. That's who you're talking to. Matron's voice, little but scratchy as chalk on a blackboard, chirped up. And pray who might this young person be? I don't believe we've been introduced. Well, Emma turned a suddenly flushed and smiling face on Omri. Wow, Omri, what fun, how fantastic. I mean, how brill can anything get? Yeah, said Omri somewhat sourly. Brill. Except that in that little hut there are some men who are wounded and who could die if we don't do something. And they are real, and I'm responsible for them. And Patrick P.O.'d. P.O.'d? What's that? Um, gone. And, uh, gone? Where? Omri took a deep breath. There's no time to explain everything now. Listen, you, you know that set of plastic figures that Tamsin got for her birthday. Emma was one jump ahead of him. Her face lit up another few watts. Yes, yes, I, I got one too. You, you mean we, we can make them all come alive? Be real, like these? Omri grabbed her arm. Wait, did you say that you got the same set of models as Tamsin? She shook off his hand. Don't pinch. No, mine was different. Mine was a sort of a shop with people with trolleys and checkouts, and Omri's heart sank. No doctors? She shook her head. No, I wanted all the doctors and all that, but Tam wouldn't swap. Omri said. Well, would she sell hers? Well, got the odd hundred quid, have you? Said Emma cynically. Well, I've got the odd five quid. Emma frowned, considering. She might not be able to resist. She's saving for a skiing holiday. Patrick's got another fiver, said Omri. 
I could, and he turned automatically towards the chest and then stopped. Um, listen, Em, I'm prepared to let you in on most of this. Well, you are in on it, but there are a couple of wrinkles that I think you might not, um, exactly feel comfortable about. Not just at first. So would you mind going downstairs for a few minutes, and then I'm going back to your place with you, and we'll negotiate for the models with Tam. She hesitated. And then come back here and do whatever it is you do to make them come alive? Omri looked at her. And now she knew about the little people, but she didn't yet know about the magic and how to make it happen. She didn't really know much when you come right down to it. There wasn't a lot she could give away, not that anyone would believe. And that was the nitty-gritty, not her knowing, but her maybe telling. Could he trust her? Could one trust anyone with a secret as exciting as this? Well, we'll have to have a serious talk, he said. On the train, just now, I want you to go out. Please, Em. They looked at each other. He actually saw her decide to give way, whether to please him or for reasons of her own, he wasn't quite sure. It didn't matter anyhow, just so that she went. The second that she was outside, he shot the bolt to make sure. Then he rushed to the cupboard, took the key out, stuck it back in the chest, and turned it. Patrick lay curled up as Omri had seen him once before, and he remembered his thought the other time. As far away as you can get without being dead. It was tempting to stand there, losing himself in speculation about where the real Patrick was, but there was no time for such thoughts. Reaching into the chest, Omri fumbled in Patrick's pocket for the five-pound note and touched something that made him snatch his hand away with a yelp as, he'd burn, as if he'd burned it. There was something alive in Patrick's pocket. Omri stood there with his heart in his gullet. It wasn't a person. It was a tiny animal of some kind with his fingertips. Omri had felt that much. Patrick must have something plastic in his pocket when he was locked in that chest, and it had come to life. Cautiously, Omri stuck his fingers into the pocket again, and yes, there it was, something small, something coated and bony. He took hold of it as gently as he could, and feeling it struggle and twist, he drew it out. It was a very distressed black horse, complete with an old Western-style saddle and bridle. Boone's horse, his new one, that Patrick had taken from the English soldier. Omri set it down very gently in the paddock on the seed tray where Little Bear's pony was tethered with a double-ply nylon thread. It threw up its head as the intruder descended from the heavens and whinnied anxiously, but as soon as the black pony's feet were on the ground and it had given itself a good shake, both their heads dropped to graze the turf of real grass Patrick had dug up and laid there. Omri smiled in relief. Evidently, Boone's pony was all right, though he wished that he could take it off its bridle and saddle. Boone must have put his old tack on it before Patrick sent him back. Suddenly, Omri went rigid, his brain fizzing with the shock of the realization that had come to him. But how could they have been so stupid? In all that haste and hassle of getting Patrick sent back, they had forgotten, forgotten the way it worked. Patrick had had the plastic figure of Boone in his hand, not the real live Boone. That meant... That meant that Boone, like the horse, would have become real inside the chest. Boone, he called frantically into the depths of the chest. Boone, where are you? Are you okay? Silence. Omri grabbed Patrick's right arm. His hand was tucked under his body. Omri dragged it out from under Patrick's dead weight. The, figure, the fingers were closed in a tight fist. Sticking out from the top of it was a tuft of ginger hair. Grimly, desperately, Omri prized Patrick's fingers open, and in his hand lay Boone, the real Boone, limp and motionless, dead, crushed. Matron! Before she knew it, the stalwart lady had been snatched off the seed tray and set down somewhat short of breath and dignity on the low table. Oh, not another patient. I've got more than I can... And then she saw her voice changed. Oh, dear me, she said softly. Oh, dearie, dearie me. And with a doomful look, she fell to her knees beside the supine figure of Boone and applied her ear to his heart. To his horror, Omri saw her give her, hat, her head half a shake. All right, guys, chapter seven, Patrick and Boone Land. Patrick's journey through time and space was swift and painless. There was a strange sort of whoosh during which he seemed to feel for a split second buffeted 
as when two heavy trucks passed close by one another, traveling at high speed in opposite directions. And then there was heat, silence, and stillness. He opened his eyes to the glare of a harsh sun and screwed them shut. He felt around with his hands. There seemed to be nothing directly in front of him. But he felt that he was upright and leaning against something blanket-like, but stiffer. Rather like a wall covered with flannel. Then he found that there was something like a wide, thick cord across his middle, holding him against the soft wall. He opened his eyes cautiously. At first, he couldn't see anything but glaring sunlight. But in a few moments, he got accustomed to that and found himself staring out across an endless expanse of sand. Well, he said aloud, it's Texas, I suppose. So this must be a bit of a desert or a prairie or something. But where was he? Where in all the sand was he? He looked downward. His hands were resting on a thick rope-like thing, as thick as his own leg, stretched across tightly his waist, and under his feet was something that curved away on either side of him and curled up several yards ahead of him. It was like standing on the brink of a huge, smooth, pale brown and empty riverbed. Behind him, it rose up like the bank of the river, but the bank felt soft to his hand, and suddenly he realized what it was. It's, it's a gigantic hat, he said aloud. I'm tied to the crown of it, and this thing must be the, the hat band, only it's a huge leather cord. He wriggled down until he was free of the cord, and into which he seemed to have been stuck quite casually like a feather, or like the flies that fishermen sometimes stuck in their hat, hat bands. Suddenly Patrick remembered that Boone had had some kind of tiny favor, so some small, someone small could hardly see it, except that it was blue, like his own jeans and sweatshirt, and the cord around his much-loved cowboy hat. Patrick crawled rapidly across the width of the brim toward its curled-up edge, and as he did so, he noticed for the first time the utter silence around him and the fact that the hat was perfectly still. I must be on Boone's head, he thought. Why isn't the hat jiggling about as he rides? And he reached the edge of the brim, pulled himself up to it, and peered over, preparing himself to see an immense drop below. The sand lay, more, lay no more than four or five times Patrick's own height beneath him. He could easily make out the individual grains, which looked to him like the shingle on an English beach, except that some of them were like lumps of yellow grass, glass. Suddenly, he stiffened and gasped. A huge creature about the size of a Galapagos tortoise moseyed by on six angled legs. Patrick shrank back behind the rim of the hat, then realizing that it was merely some kind of beetle and that it couldn't reach him. He raised himself cautiously and followed its progress off across the endless expanse of sand. He looked around as far as he could for the enormous bulk of the hat, which loomed against the sky like a soft cornered building. There was no sign of anything else alive. The first thing is to get down from here, he thought. Even if it's dangerous, there's no real point in staying here. He considered the problem of getting down to the ground. If the sand below had been the size of sand, he might have risked jumping onto it. Or then again, he thought, peering down, he might not. But it would be suicide to jump down onto those big, hard stones. He'd have to lower himself somehow. Patrick, unlike Omri, was athletic. He really shone in P.E. and loved climbing and jumping and swinging. What he needed now was some kind of a rope, and of course, the first thing he thought of was that hat band. He followed it around the crown of the hat again until he found the knot. Luckily, it was old. The leather itself was soft and the knot loosely tied. By forcing one of the ends back upon itself through the knot twice, he managed to untie it. And then with great effort, he managed to drag one end around the crown until he had about half of it at his disposal. And he carefully lowered the free end down over the brim. The immediate danger was that his weight, though relatively slight, would pull down the whole thing to the ground when he tried to slide down it. But he had to risk that. Taking a deep breath, he threw his right leg over the stiff brim, embraced the throng with arms and legs as if he were sliding down a tree trunk, and away he went. He was down almost before he had time to think, and as his feet touched the stones, he felt the rest of the throng fall away from the hat. He just managed to leap aside as it fell, like an immense and heavy snake onto the ground, missing him by a hair's breadth. He took another deep breath and looked around. 
The first thing he saw was a huge impenetrable mass of what looked like fine copper fuse wires. He touched one and it was very flexible. It certainly wasn't a wire, it was more like... Patrick gasped. He suddenly knew what it was, and knowing that, he knew in a flash that something had gone very wrong. The mass of wires was Boone's ginger hair sticking out from underneath his hat. Patrick started to run, and it was not easy running on the glassy shingle, but trying not to stumble too often, he made his way as fast as he could right around to the other side of that huge thing, like a promontory, which was actually Boone's head jutting out of the desert landscape. When he got there, he stopped, staring, stepped back, and stared again. At last he realized that to get to the, to the face in perspective, he would have to move back still further. He turned and ran away from it for about a hundred paces and then turned again. Yes, now he could see. It was Boone. He was lying on his side, the bulk of him rising from the flat desert floor like a range of hills. And though his face was turned to the side, the hat was lying horizontally across one ear as if someone had dropped it there, uh, not as if Boone had been wearing it when he toppled to the ground. And on his bristly face was an expression that made Patrick very uneasy. In the distance behind Boone loomed a large desert cactus, the top of which, like Jack's beanstalk, was too high for Patrick to see. It looked as if it were growing out of Boone's shoulder. Patrick narrowed his eyes. He focused on one wicked-looking cactus needle that stuck out against the hard blue of the sky, just above Boone's uppermost arm. If he was breathing, even shallowly, the shoulder level would rise and the spike would disappear. It didn't. Patrick caught his own breath and held it until he nearly burst. He had suddenly realized his fatal mistake. He had taken a plastic boon back with him. The living boon had gone back to England, and to Omri and Patrick's present, in the same instant that Patrick had come here, they must have crossed. That was the meaning of the whooshing sensation of something passing him as he traveled through time and space. Patrick sat down abruptly, and as abruptly jumped up again, the glassy stones were very hot. Everything was very hot. He felt dizzy. He tottered back a few yards until he was in Boone's shadow and sank down again to think. He must have done something to Boone, who had been clutched tightly in his hand when he climbed into the chest. Maybe, maybe he'd killed him. No maybe about it. Boone, in the instant of the transfer, had fallen down here in the desert, breathless, lifeless, a terrible guilt backed up by an overwhelming sorrow threatened Patrick, but being a very practical boy, he shoved them both roughly to the back of his mind and considered instead of his own situation. He was on his own, no boon to take care of him, minute, helpless, miles from anywhere, and at that mercy of the sun and the empty desert, it seemed like a fairly safe bet that soon enough he would follow Boone once again, this time into the oblivion of death. All right, guys our last chapter for this video. Chapter 8, A Heart Stops Beating. The suspense was awful, the worst of Omri's life. He watched Matron bending over the still figure in the plaid shirt and chaps. Boone, so real, so very much of a person, and yet so vulnerable that Patrick's hand closing on him in the instance of being swung back through time and space could have squeezed the life out of him. Omri thought what Patrick would feel when he came back. If he learned that he had killed Boone, killed him, crushed him to death, and suddenly Omri knew that it was for Patrick's sake, more than Boone's in a way, that Matron had to breathe life back into that tiny body as she was now trying to do. Matron, shh. She had stopped giving Boone the kiss of life and began giving him artificial resuscitation, hands on his ribs, throwing her weight forward and back, panting from the effort she was making. Is, is, is he alive? whispered Omri. Yes, she said shortly between pushes. Just, just, just about. Well, what's wrong? Is he crushed? Crushed? Of course not. He's been half suffocated, that's all. She put her ear to his chest again. Well, where's his hat? said Omri suddenly. Matron straightened herself with an exclamation. His hat? she said sharply. What in the world does that matter when his heart stopped? Oh, his heart stopped. Omri's own heart nearly did the same. Then he is dead. Well, well, not if we can... Wait. You could do it. He needs a good thump on the chest to get it going again. I just haven't the strength. Come here and do exactly as I show you. Now watch. Peering at her, he saw her do something with her tiny fingers. What? She gave an exclamation of exasperation. 
Are you blind? It's a flicking movement. Flick your finger out from behind your thumb. Oh, you mean like this? Right, now do it downward against his chest. No, not so gently. Do it hard. Thump him, man, thump him, she cried agitatedly. Omri flicked his middle finger so hard that his nail struck against Boone's chest, rocking his body. Again! Omri repeated the movement, and Matron then pushed his finger out of the way and once more laid her ear against Boone's plaid shirt front. Ah, is it? I do believe, I think, I'm almost certain, yes. She raised a beaming, sweat-glossed face. You've done the trick. Well done. Oh, well done indeed. You've saved him. Now, bring me something warm to wrap him up in while I go and fix him an injection of heart stimulant. Look, look, he's beginning to breathe normally. What a relief. I was really afraid he was a goner. Armory, feeling weak with relief, rushed to hack out another square from his shattered sweater, already jagged, hemmed due to all the miniature blankets that he'd cut out from it. Matron hurried up the ramp onto the seed tray and into the longhouse. She emerged at once with a hypodermic syringe and an ampoule so small that Omri just had to guess it was there. She knelt beside Boone and now warmly covered and injected straight into his chest. Now listen, young man, we've saved this one between us, but the emergency cases in there are still in desperate need of expert attention. You will really have to secure qualified medical aid. Omri! He turned, and Little Bear was standing nearby, arms folded. What happened, Boone? Oh, well, he's had an accident. Axe? Dent? Enemy's dent head with tomahawk? No, no, something else. It's, it's okay. Matron will take care of him. Good. Little Bear bent down and touched Boone's red hair. Omri felt quite choked up at this tender gesture, until the Indian added, Sometime I sorry Boone, my blood brother. Little Bear, surely you're not still hankering after his scalp. The Indian fingered the hair regretfully and grunted. <laughs> Fine color, like sugar tree leaf, very bad if other brave get. He gave Boone's head a sharp, possessive pat and straightened up. Dance finish, you take dead brave's plastique put in ground. Little Bear, I, I can't now. I must go with Emma. Did, did, did you see her? She, she saw you. I have to make sure she helps and doesn't tell. Little Bear looked troubled. Woman tongue stay still like falling water, like grass and wind. You go. Keep hand ready to stop mouth of Emma. First put Little Bear back in Longhouse with wife, son. Well, you don't want to be sent back to the village yet? Little Bear, usually so phlegmatic, suddenly twisted his face, threw up his arms, and turned his body first one way, then the other. Very bad. Need be two place same time. Want to be here, not leave hurt braves. Need to be there with tribe. Very bad. One man heart cut in two. This was more than Omri could cope with. He lifted the five Indians, including Little Bear, off the table and deposited them hastily on the seed tray. Bright stars came running out of the longhouse with her baby in her arms, and Little Bear embraced her. We'll decide what you should do when I get back, said Omri, and he turned to Matron. Can I leave you? In a good cause, yes. Well, give me an hour. As he came running downstairs, he sensed at once that Emma had gone. He felt bereft, though he didn't entirely blame her. Waiting down here by herself, no doubt she had suddenly been overcome with the feeling that it was all too much for her and that she wanted to run off home to her everyday life. But he couldn't let her go. Of course he couldn't. He grabbed his parka and dashed out of the house. As soon as he turned out of his gate onto Hobble Road, Omri smelled trouble. What do you guys think happened? He saw them halfway down, outside the amusement arcade, a whole crowd of them. You know who they are. He couldn't see Emma, but something in the way... The skinheads were crowding around. Something in their stance and the sounds that drifted to him along the streets told him that she was there in the midst of them, trapped, that they were taunting her, the same mindless bullying treatment that he had had from them so often himself. Without his conscious command, his feet drove into a hard run. He didn't stop to think or give himself time to get scared. He just rammed into them head on. A piercing pain blew up like fireworks in his head. He'd completely forgotten his burn. He clutched the place and felt the bandage, and at the same time, the circle bent and broke, letting him through, and he saw the faces, first astounded, then twisting into sniggering laughter. Cool, if it ain't that old Ayatollah. 
Emma was standing erect and defiant, her lip curled in contempt as she faced the tallest of the gang. Omri recognized him instantly. You're just an ugly, bullying creep, she threw at him. Slag, he sneered. Nerd. And then he noticed Omri. His whole face altered, unwholesomely pale already. It turned the dead color of putty. His jaw went slack, as if Omri's own fear had erupted and were mirrored in this other face. You, he gasped. Yeah, me, said Omri, panting, dry-mouthed. There were so many of them. You lot leave her alone, or else. A concerted jeer rose from the circle. Oh, look out, lads. Fall flat on your faces and worship him, or he's liable to start a holy war. But their leader, the big youth who'd been going on at Emma, glanced furiously around at his mates, and the jeering laughter died. He reached up grimy fingers and unconsciously caressed his face, across which, in a diagonal line, were a dozen tiny raw dots. How you done that, he muttered. His eyes narrowed as he looked at Omri. I'd give a lot to know how you done what you done to me. Omri contented himself with a tight little smile. He took Emma by the arm. Come on, Em, let's go. The tall boy gave a kind of twitch of his shaved head. The circle wavered and then gave way and let them through, though not without murmurings of puzzlement and rebellion. Just as they came clear, Omri had a thought. He paused and he reached into his jeans pocket. He turned casually back. Could they see how his heart was pounding? Oh, by the way, he held out his hand. I think one of you dropped this. And he held up the pin light that he'd picked up after the burglar's hasty departure. The tall skinhead reached for it automatically, took hold of it, and then suddenly let it go as if it were red hot. It fell to the pavement and where it rolled into the gutter. Several of the others made a dive for it. Leave it, the leader barked. Don't touch it. It might blow up in your face. Omri stared at him for a moment. That great, thieving, bullying lout was really afraid of him. It wasn't entirely a good feeling, but it was better than the other way around, which was the way that it had always been before. Now all the faces looking at him were pallid and nervous. Take away their gang courage, and they really were a pathetic-looking crew. Omri felt the beginnings of a sneer twisting in his own mouth, but it felt ugly even from inside, so he was glad when Emma tugged his arm. They walked quickly down to the station, leaving a defeated silence behind them. And that was the end of Chapter 8. So thank you guys for listening. I really appreciate it. No code word this week. Just answer the five questions. And listen, you all have a very Merry Christmas. All right, take care. Bye.